Okay, hello and welcome everybody. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today for a conversation crescendo for racial justice in opera. This program is part of Seattle Opera's community conversation series, which began in 2017 to address social issues and themes of operas presented during our season as they relate to us today. To start, I'd like to give a land acknowledgement. In Seattle, we, along with the people we serve, live and work on the land of the Coast Salish people. We must continue to show recognition and respect for the indigenous peoples who have been and continue to be stewards of this land. If you are unfamiliar with the land that you occupy and the indigenous people of that land, I do highly recommend that you look up that information. Today's conversation will be an opportunity for us to acknowledge the harmful racist history of opera and look to how opera can reemerge as a space of belonging, healing, and liberation for communities of color. Though we'll cover the impacts on all people of color, we will center blackness in our conversations. Throughout the conversation, you can ask questions via the Q&A button. Please note that the chat function is disabled. And this is a pretty tightly packed conversation, so I hope that we're gonna to get to all of your questions or that at least we'll address them through the course of our conversation today. I am so delighted to be joined by an extremely talented panel. Uh, they all have very impressive resumes. Um, I'm not gonna list all of their accolades just so that we can get straight to the conversation today, but I do wanna introduce them. Naomi Andre, professor at the University of Michigan and Seattle Opera's scholar in residence. Matthew Ozawa, stage director, artist director, and educator. Kazim Abdullah, conductor. And Janae Bridges, mezzo soprano. Okay, thank you all so much for your patience. I apologize, but this is pretty um, important stuff and I wanna make sure that we didn't miss it. I am gonna go back and just um, recap um, what I was saying in terms of where we are right now, um, the pandemic changing the way that we operate, um, and most importantly, the, um, the upswell in the Black Lives Matter movement um, after the death of George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd on May 25th. Um, and, and the refocused attention on, on the Black Lives Matter movement. A lot of companies throughout the, opera companies throughout the U.S. have been holding space for Black artists and artists of colors to share their experiences. And social media accounts, um, such as Opera is Racist, have publicly displayed the, the undeniable truth that opera has and continues to work in and uphold a racist system. And it has also been a time of lifting up black excellence and the brilliance of POC artists um, through, through social media accounts as well. At Seattle Opera, we continue our commitment to justice for black Americans and for all people of color, and will continue to prioritize our own anti-racism work and growth, amplify the work of black opera artists and creatives, and through dialogue and listening, create change for a more diverse and inclusive opera and classical music industry. We will also make amends where we have caused harm. It's our goal to create a future where black, indigenous, and other people of color are an integral part of the creation of operas on and off stage. So to begin our conversation, I've asked the panelists to share with us how this moment has impacted them personally. How has it impacted the way you think about your work? Uh, what are you looking to change either personally um, or in your work as a result of this movement and moment in time? And what does this change about how you view your role in opera moving forward? And Janae, I'd love to start with you um, on this commentary. Hi. Thank you for that introduction. Um, that's an interesting question. <laughs> I honestly, I, um, I feel actually like the work is not really mine to do. Um, I, I feel exhausted emotionally. It's, it's a very laborious um, emotional task to, to actually even speak about about these subjects. Um, however, I am, I am happy to do so because I for once feel like um, ears are open in a way that they've never been open before. Um, and I can attest to people being 
very ready to change and willing to change. So for me, I, if, if anything, I feel um, hopeful and um, inspired, actually, very inspired to, to see this um, emergence of, um, of action that's being taken. So, yeah, I mean, personally, I, I, it hasn't necessarily changed the way that I approach my art form and my, and my voice. I've always um, sought after being the best artist that I can be. And I have had the blessing and, and, and the privilege of being raised by a family that um, has not um, I've been raised in a way that it's like, okay, this racism thing, that's actually your issue. <laughs> it's not my issue. So I haven't, I, I haven't necessarily taken on that burden. And I'm, while it's very real and, and, and actually quite present in my life, I don't give, um, I don't give power to it. Um, however, I do use my power and I'm, and I'm getting more and more comfortable in using my power to speak about it so that we can just eradicate this thing and, 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 and make people aware of their um, inherent biases. And um, yeah, I think, I think it will improve everybody's art making, honestly, because you're, I'm able to, to be more of myself. I know that even though I, I feel like I'm quite confident and, and um, I don't usually feel like I have to explain myself, but subconsciously, I think I do. So <laughs> This, this has actually given th this whole time that we're in has, has um, what's the word that I'm looking for? It's given, no, not given me permission, but um, empowered me. It's empowered me. And I, I think with that, um, my art making will, will become even more um, true, authentic, and hopefully, uh, you know, fill more seats, fill more seats um, with people that look like me, and and um, yeah, that are all that of all age groups and um, ethnicities, and yeah. Sorry, I'm rambling a bit, but I. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing so openly and truthfully about your experience. That's what we're here. Um, to, to tap into as well. Uh, Kazim, I'd love to hear from you and, and where you are with all of this. Sure. Um, I think, you know, I've had this time during uh, COVID-19, I guess, to sort of really think and reflect on like the murders of Black people in this country, especially in the last 10 years um, and yeah, you know, that sort of being tangential to just having had a black president and then being in a, um, under new presidential leadership um, after that. And I think um, what it just kind of confirmed and showed me is just how deeply entrenched institutionalized um, racism is sort of, not just in America, but actually worldwide. I mean, you know, we saw the protests sort of happening all over. But the one thing I can say is I'm encouraged to sort of see um, see people throughout the world react and kind of realize that we were kind of on this wrong path. And um, and I guess for me personally, I just, um, you know, I'd like to see sort of more inclusion of black people and minorities, both on and behind the stage. And I, I would say just, you know, as we all keep pushing forward, and thinking about these issues that we, um, yeah, like, you know, I think it's just a perfect time for opera companies and arts organizations to really try to do the right thing. And as far as affecting my art, I mean, I, I, it hasn't necessarily uh, affected the way I interpret music or think about music, but it's definitely, um, uh, yeah, you know, I guess I hope as we emerge from this time that I'll, you know, that I'll just be given uh, the opportunities to sort of share the art form to um, share music with as many people as possible. And I would say that, um, uh, yeah, you know, and you know, just sort of reflecting on the time, one thing I've realized, I guess, is that the older that I've gotten, the more I've sort of been more outspoken about um, 
certain racial is issues that emerge uh, in our field. And so um, I think uh, I want to just for me personally, not, um, not, um, I want to just sort of continue to try to speak against certain injustices uh, any chance that I get. So. Great, thank you. Yeah. Naomi would love to hear from you. Not my mouse right here. <laughs> I appreciate how candid um, Janae and Kazim have spoken, and I want to say amen to this feeling of exhaustion and this feeling of, um, I wasn't surprised really because I live this, you know, my life and my skin and I see my friends and I know what's going on. And yet it just, when all this stuff after the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey, the people before, and then like going back to Emmett Till and people, it's just exhausting. And it makes me sad because I thought when I was in my twenties a while ago, we had fixed these things. I thought the civil rights movement was behind us and there was sort of the energy to move on and it was okay. And I knew deep down that it wasn't as okay as I wanted to pretend it was. And so I'll just, <laughs> without trying to rain on everyone's parade, this has been a really, really hard time. And as a professor, uh, although I did teach during the first of two summer sessions, um, so that was really tough. The class in the beginning of May before Memorial Day and then the class afterwards, I realized that a lot of us are going back to school or starting up in September with new academic years and it'll be the first time that people are getting together in classrooms after this has happened and so I'm really thinking and, and conscious about this. I um, So I, I love hearing about the hope Janae and Kazim talked about and I do believe that this is a time where we can sort of move forward and I think the needle is shifting just a little bit, but I want to give space, especially in this, you know, BIPOC, you know, people of color panel, that it's exhausting and we're trying our best and doing our best and we will. And the energy of people who are finally seeing some of these things is wonderful. And it's also wonderful when it can be translated to the arts, the space that has been sort of relegated as an elitist space, but it's actually no, we, we have people who are working. We are trying to get more audience members of people of color, but there's still some there and we, we need this and we make this and this is so relevant to who we are and what we're doing. Thank you, Naomi, and thank you for for really naming that exhaustion. Um, because obviously, with even with um, Janae's statement at the beginning too, it's you are not alone, and we do have to recognize and understand that that is part of the conversation that we are having and moving forward. Right, I and mean, we are also responsible for um, for adding to that, um, and we are responsible for um, for for helping take some of that away right um and so that's, that's some of the work that we've got to that we've got to get to matthew would love to hear from you i um oh i i will just say you know i'm obviously the only um non-black panelist um a part of this and so i i will say that from a, a poc perspective it's been interesting sort of being um kind of in the middle of 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 what's going on. Um, obviously the, the pandemic combined with Black Lives Matter and the deaths and the murders and the injustices, at least for me, has been really painful. Um, I would say from an industry perspective, you know, I've had every single nine new productions that I had through 2022 be canceled um, or postponed because of the pandemic. So just the grieving of the loss of artistry that you know, um, myself and many artists were going to bring to these companies and new perspectives on the rep. It's really sad to see all that go. Uh, simultaneously, Black Lives Matter has really, um, have, has been a little bit shocking and removing the rose colored glasses 
um, regarding our repertory and our industry practices. Uh, you know, I've been in it for now for 17 years. I've often been the only Asian in the building, sometimes the only person of color in different um, rooms or environments, uh, working with administrators and, and production and behind the scenes. And, and I've realized over time um, my own being complicit in, in, in the, the white supremacy and the racism. So, just, so it's been a, a tension because of course, I've experienced a lot of racism in the industry. Um, some of it much more obvious than others. Um, and then in other ways, I have uh, perpetuated it by, for example, um, directing Butterfly in a traditional manner where we maybe remove yellow face, but people are still shuffling around pretending to be a culture and race and ethnicity that they're not. So I realize that I can no longer participate in perpetuating stereotypes or racist practices. Um, and conversely, can no longer stay silent when I witness or experience this racism. Um, you know, Asians were known as being not only the model minority, but also the silent minority. And that has really been weighing down on me um, and not wanting to be silent. And so I think that what uh, Janae and Kazim were saying about finding hope and being resilient in this time period where we are exhausted from like the daily experience of this, um, my hope is that we can actively address this within our um, industry um, and, and undo the systems that are upholding this oppression and exclusion, right? We have so much exclusion and an inability for so many BIPOC individuals from entering into this field. And so, you know, I've been interested in the pipeline issue um, and a commitment to equity and inclusion and also this idea of accountability you know, holding companies and leaders accountable for not just speaking, you know, um, or making a statement about supporting Black Lives Matter, but actually acting upon it. And then not just placing, you know, Black individuals into all these positions, but making sure that they are not set up to fail. So that is some big, something big that I've been thinking about. That's fantastic. Thank you, Matthew. Um, and that is that is extremely important. I think you're right. You know, we saw um, a lot of companies um, making statements um, and, and Seattle Opera um, sent, sent out our own statement during that time, too. But I think the real um, I'm sure there's some kind of witty uh, saying I'm terrible at, Amer at American um, uh, idioms, but um, uh, around, you know, now we're gonna know, right? Like now the truth is gonna come out and we'll see who's actually able to make the change, who's actually able to hold true to the commitment that they have made. Um, as we journey on in this conversation, I didn't wanna take um, a, a quick minute to root this in opera in America. Um, Cause I, I think it's really important for us to recognize um, what sets sets us apart in some ways in these issues. And, and the way that I wanted to do that was to talk very briefly about America's legacy of minstrelsy and how that has impacted racial representation in entertainment and on the opera stage. And for any of you who are listening who have not yet um, delved into the 1619 Project, um, there is a segment around music and entertainment that um, I found really powerful and sort of sent me off on this journey of really understanding and unpacking all of this. Um, and thankfully we have Naomi um, on our panel here um, and I've asked her to give us um, just a brief history around, you know, what are the tropes of minstrelsy that continue to cause harm and show up in the arts and opera today? And how is that impacting people both on and off stage um, in opera? Sure, one of the, and I will keep this brief because even though I'm a professor, I could go on and I talk about this in classes, but I want to let people know that the history of minstrelsy is something that is baked into the DNA of the United States. It's a vaudeville art form that started around the 1820s. There are different origin stories, but it basically was um, skits and dances and theatrical productions that were based on a white 
um, imagination of blackness. In the beginning, it was only white people who would literally darken their skin with burnt cork and have very big red mouths. And there were these certain stereotypes that emerged that you're probably um, aware of. And if you're not, they're still connected to who we are in the United States. There's the happy-go-lucky, lazy plantation slave this, who's turned into the Sambo, or the fast-talking uh, urban coon. I hate using these terms. There's the Jezebel and the Buck, two hyper-sexualized Black characters who threatened Black ma white masculinity with the Jezebel and Black uh, and white femininity with the um, Buck, where these two people would sort of take away, sort of seduce white people and want to be um, sexually um, ravished. There's the mammy. There, so these, and the mammy is the domestic, the Aunt Jemima, who would take care of the white master and his family, and everything would be um, okay. And this was an asexualized figure. So we have inherited this. And some of you probably noted in June that um, Aunt Jemima and her colleagues, Uncle Ben, have been um, retired. Um, Quaker Oats and Mars Incorporated, who sort of run the Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben's, they've decided to do something um, different. They haven't really said what they're going to do, and it's going to take the rest of the year. But these are images that are in the grocery stores that you still see. And even if you don't know about them, parts of culture are still haunting us today. You can look this up, but even as recently as within the past couple of years, Gucci and Prada and Katy Perry had fashion brands that had um, a sweater that came up over the mouth with be a black sweater with big red lips. That, that was one of the Gucci things. I mean, so these images, they were later withdrawn, but the fact that it got that far is I want people to realize that we are not done with these. And so it's important to know about it and sort of remember we've had um, Justin Trudeau and Robert Northam who have had uh, political leaders, Justin Trudeau, the prime minister of Canada and Robert Northam, the governor of Virginia, who had pictures from the eighties when they had been blackened up. So, to think that minstrelsy is something only in the past, sadly, that's not true. And even as early as the 1860s, minstrelsy was in South Africa. It went all over Europe. So it's sort of this American sadness that was um, imported around the world. This affects how we today in 2020 and 2021 see images of black people and people of color and think sort of this reinforced hypersexualization don't take people seriously. Um, yeah, that black people are there to serve other folks is, um, is tough. So uh, to sort of wrap all this up, this idea of um, who represents whom, um, who is do, who's in the room where it happens when Gucci and Prada were, you know, making these decisions. Who is there when little children are wanting to dress as cowboys and Indians? Um, and this is, you know, cultures and not costumes. So this is sort of haunting us still. And so when we have operas that use black face or yellow face, it is resuscitating this painful trauma that's all around our culture that we all are suffering from. So we need to know about it and then we need to move past it. Thank you, Naomi, for sharing that history. I found that really important. Um, and in the context of that segment in the 1619 Project, um, I found it really interesting that it was um, it, 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 the, um, the journalist whose name I'm completely forgetting right now. Wesley Morris. Um, did a Wesley good Morris. Job. Thank you. Yes. Well, he, you know, he entered that conversation um, by saying that Americans at the time, their form of entertainment was opera. Right. And so like this was all that they were listening to was classical music and opera. And then this was the first real American form of entertainment that came out. And so, you know, my question for for the panelists um, here is how do we see this this racist legacy of minstrelsy? Um, how has it impacted? How do you think it might have impacted and affected the way that opera has grown in America? Um, and how are we, we implicit in perpetuating this legacy moving forward or have been? We're working to change it. 
Um, I guess I can say something. I mean, um, so I recently read a book uh, called Cast. It's by Isabel Wilkerson. And it's a book where she sort of compares the caste system to India, which is of course multi-tiered to what you would call like a sort of a caste system in the United States, where you kind of, if one is just speaking sort of um, broadly, like, you know, white people being on top and black people on the bottom, you could say. And uh, yes, of, and of course there's nuance in that of course as well, but that's the general framework of um, that American caste system. And I think, Opera has kind of existed in that caste system, if you think about it. Um, and yeah, you know, that that's kind of has been represented through works like Porgy and Bess. And you could say it's also kind of represented in sort of the, the yeah, like, you know, in the fact that there's so few conductors or directors that get to work in leadership positions in opera where you're sort of controlling the flow and all of these things. And so, um, and so, yeah, you know, like if you kind of think it, think of it in on those terms i mean um american opera has kind of existed under that kind of framework if you think about it um yeah. i'm not sure if anyone else has something to say but. yeah no i i completely agree with you kazim i never thought of it in that way um but i know for me personally and many of my colleagues um of of all ethnic backgrounds we feel that there is this hierarchy and there is um, I'm not sure if that it's a good or bad thing. It just is what it is, but it at times feels very oppressive. Um, and so, you know, that that's for everybody involved. But I think when you talk to a black person and even a black woman, it's just like, we feel more and more of that um, weight. So I, I think first acknowledging that, that that's, that's present and it is an issue um, is a first step. Also, I've been, I've been thinking about um, my relationship with opera. I've played so many different characters and I, I've sung Suzuki, which is um, a Japanese character in Madame Butterfly. And I love the role, I love the opera. Um, I love the story, the music, every, I think it's just, it's a beautiful um, piece of art, but I felt and feel very weird about um, playing a Japanese woman this is someone's culture. And so while um, I am an actress, something about it just does not feel um, genuine, because it's, <laughs> it's, it's not, it's I'm acting, um, but it, it feels disrespectful as well. So I've been asking myself, like, how, how can I play these characters with, with authenticity and with sensitivity and empathy um, there's definitely a way. I mean, I act in every opera world. I, I'm I'm not a gypsy. I'm I'm not a whore, <laughs> you know. Um, so it's an interesting topic, and I I, I don't know how necessarily. I, I don't think there's one concrete way in which we change these things, but I think the acknowledgement of the racist history of each and almost each and every one of these masterpieces is there. Um, so yeah, because, yeah, oh, Kazim, sorry, did I jump in? No, please, no, I wasn't gonna say anything. I'm, I'm gonna mute myself. Oh, oh no, I, I was just gonna completely, you know, say yes, you know, in the sense that we, I think because of the history, we can't, we can't take these pieces away from the history that they're in. You know, how Asian Americans experience butterfly is totally different than how Japanese in Japan experience butterfly because eight Japanese Americans were interned during World War II when they were citizens, you know, and put into cages and kind of left in these desert situations. So I think that the Asian Americans, or at least other minority groups, I often, you know, immigrant groups feel that they're the perpetual foreigner, obviously, these, these you know, uh, feelings come from the history that it exists within. And you know, I'll briefly just say that rape, rep, racial representation on the stage for other minority groups 
was, yes, very pervasive in the 19th century, also where there was the practice of yellow face in theatrical performances, right? Where white actors put on yellow makeup to impersonate Asians to distort perceptions of Chinese immigrants, obviously pushing negative stereotypes of emasculated, you know, characters serving Euro-American masters and pushing the agenda to exclude immigrants from becoming American citizens due to perceived economic and job market threats. Right, like so a great example is Henry Grimm's the four act play, The Chinese Must Go, right? So these kinds of pieces of theater that was the American theater then resulted in so many other incidences because people started to take these negative perceptions and think that they were true. And so then you have the Chinese massacre of 1871 in Los Angeles, which resulted in the hanging of 17 to 20 Chinese immigrants, the death of Vincent Chin recently in 1982 in Detroit, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which is the first and only law implemented to prevent all members of a specific ethnic group from immigrating to the US, the Immigration Act of 1924, the Japanese internment. I mean, you can just go on and on and on. And this exclusion within minorities from being accepted into the US, you know, of, of, of feeling that they have to assimilate. And, you know, when I look at assimilation, assimilation it's like, you're not necessarily accepting someone's culture or their race or you're, you're kind of forcing them to have to be American, which is sort of a Caucasian perspective of speaking in a certain way, behaving in a certain way. And I think that is pervasive within our industry. I know we'll talk about the systems of power within opera, which is like full on systems of hierarchy. But I think that we see these negative stereotypes all over the place. Right, we see them in Madama Butterfly, we see it in Turandot, we see it in Pearl Fishers. You know, I think a lot of leaders are like, oh, it's fantasy, so it's not really real, it's exotic. And I'm like, no, 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 we're still actually perpetuating racism and appropriation. And, you know, Janae, it's such a fascinating, you know, topic I've been thinking about of like, okay, what happens with pieces like Butterfly when most of the people in it are not Japanese or Asian, you know, and, and we've been having big conversations about, well, does it have to be all Asians? What does that mean when it's not? And I think part of it is acknowledging the, the separation between like performing in it and then who is guiding the ship for that? You know, what is the interpretation? What is the, you know, um, how are they treating the material? Um, are they asking you to, you know, are they an expert because they went to a tea ceremony in Japan? So they're, you know, asking you to shuffle in a certain way. Um, and, you know, in my viewpoint, I'm like, I kind of feel right at the moment that, that anyone, you know, performing in even like Pearl Fishers who isn't Asian is kind of perpetuating appropriation. You know, so they may have a great time because it's a really diverse cast of people, but you're still appropriating some other culture other than your own when you're donning certain garb, when you're, you know, behaving in a certain manner. That doesn't mean that we can't re-look at these pieces and like evolve and shift over time. But I think where we are in America right now, I don't know. I think we actually really have to ask these questions. And I think we can't use the excuse of, oh, there are no Asian singers. So we're not gonna, you know, have any Asians in these pieces. They exist, you just like have to look. Yeah, uh, thank you, Matthew. And Naomi, I don't know if you wanted to add um, another comment before we, yeah, um, transition on that. I am so grateful that there are these conversations and to bring up the really thorny, tough things. Matthew, thank you for talking about this because a lot of the immigration acts and things you mentioned around the Japanese and Chinese, that's not part of regular history that we're taught. So we don't know it, just like we don't know what minstrelsy is, like what's out there. I think things, here's a positive thing, because I feel a little guilty for saying, you know, I'm so exhausted about all these issues up front. Don't feel guilty, don't feel guilty. <laughs> Thank you. A positive thing is that I think we have moved from, oh my gosh, look, there's black face and yellow face, and we're, you know, representing cultures, and we're finally noticing it. Now I think sort of if that was sort of opera racism or race relations 101, I think we're at 202 and we need to say, okay, 
how do we do this? Do we cut out the opera and just cancel it? Which, oh my God, that would break my heart. As Janae said, you know, I love singing the music of Suzuki and it's gorgeous. And, and I love Otello and I, you know, so we're at the stage where I think we get to, the people in the industry, as with um, conversations with the audiences, we get to talk about what is okay or how are different ways we can do this in the opera world. The opera world is one where we need people of color singing Mozart and Strauss, where race is not always officially identified but sort of assumed white. Because if we didn't let black people sing Susanna in Figaro, I would cry. <laughs> that would be wrong. <laughs> so, but we need to think about if black people can sing everything or Asian people can sing everything, then what happens when we find a voice that can sing Turando, or well, Turando's hard because that is sort of a problematic opera on other issues, <laughs> but we have voices that can sing um, Madama Butterfly. I've heard that Latanya Moore is just one of the most stunning butterflies right now. And she's an African American woman. So do we say no, no, that would make me sad. I as an audience member and lover of opera, I want to hear these voices sing it. So I think what we need is we're at this level where we are talking about it. And we need to find sensitive ways, and that's only going to happen when you have representation in the administration and allow a safe or courageous space to talk about it, where we can say, okay, what are we going to do for community conversations, front of the house, lobby displays, program essays, like how are we going to get this information out there? That is very, very exciting. Yeah, and I, I, I think so too, Naomi, that it's um, about um, digging into the conversation. Um, Matthew, you alluded to, um, to this, but I mean, there are, we are so unaware sometimes of our role in these white supremacy, in this white supremacy culture and the characteristics that we continue to uphold. Um, Janae mentioned this um, power dynamic. That's, that is a characteristic of white supremacy culture. Matthew, you talked about it in terms of assimilating, right? We come into this country um, as people of different ethnicities, cultures, race, and told to act like the culture of the country, which is white. Um, and so, you know, that that's, these are the things that then we start to internalize um, and without being able to identify them um, and really honestly talk about them, it does become really hard to, um, to change, I think. And, you know, Matthew, I wanted to go back to you because you were um, sort of headed this direction in your, in your commentary, but, you know, so, we love we love these works. We love our Puccini and our Verdi and and our Mozart. Like we're here because at some point we have our own origin story about how we connected, right? So what would it mean then to be able to walk into a space, into an opera space, either as an artist or um, as an audience member, and be unapologetic about who you are? Um, and, and what part of your identity brings in either your culture or your race or doesn't, right? Because there's also a lot that's perceived about you um, without you even opening your mouth, um, right? So, so what would it mean to be able to walk into, into a process um, and just be completely unapologetic about that? And you may be practicing that now. Um, I mean, I think a big thing is just being seen, um, having a voice. Um, and I think reclaiming the narratives. You know, I think that for me, I've spent a lot of time taking Butterfly and directing Butterfly over and over again, because I really want to reclaim the narrative, the East-West conflict for Japanese Americans, because I see it differently. You know, I am half, you know, East and West. And so the idea of, of walking into an opera house where I feel safe and I can help transform, you know, these operas by reimagining them and reinterpreting them and reigniting them, um, I think is, you know, an exciting prospect. I mean, I think that, yes, the idea of, of, of more perspectives and thoughts and ideas in the rehearsal room, in administration, amongst staff, backstage, like this inevitably is a positive thing because it just allows 
a greater sense for people to be who they really are and not feel like they have to be silent or they have to, you know, um, behave a certain way in order to get by and in order to make it in the industry. You know, many people contact me who are early in their career and they say, hey, I'm in this situation. I feel like I can't speak up because I feel I will never get hired again. And I think that's really linked to the sort of lack of transparency and the hierarchy, the systems of, of power that exists within opera that, that keeps individuals, in particular, the, the Black and, and POC community, from being able to feel that they belong within this world. And until our stories are being told and until we are able to interpret them and not have them interpreted by others or you know where we're told how to behave by a caucasian even though we are <laughs> of that race or ethnicity you know i think that 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 comes from leadership um and i think that there is the potential for instead of individualism and and silence to feel empowered and be in a collective collaborative unity mm. today did you want to add to that Yes, um, you hit so many <laughs> nails on the head for me. Um, yeah, I, this idea of being unapologetically black <laughs> is, um, it's, eh, I, I don't really go around saying that term, but for me, that means literally just being who I am. You know, walking in a room and being who I am and not feeling like um, I'm going to be demonized or, 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 um, or reprimanded, you know, for just being who I am. And that includes speaking out, calling something when I see it, um, saying to a conductor, you know, I wouldn't do it that way. <laughs> you know, like I should not feel like I can't say that. It's my art, it's my voice, it's who I am. Um, but I, I oftentimes feel like I can't. So yeah, I think what Matthew said is just like being comfortable to be who you are, feeling comfortable to just be who you are. And that also means for me, seeing people that look like me in the opera house, running things in, in higher positions. I want to see a black woman artistic director. I want to see a black woman conductor, a black man conductor, that this is, how I will feel more comfortable. And, and this is what being unapologetically anything means um, for me. And so, you know, these, these narratives that we have, these white narratives that we have been um, fed for hundreds of years, they just have to go, you know? Um, and, and we need to be able to tell our own stories. There needs to be if Poor Gimbes is going to continue, the music is incredible. I have issues with the opera, but if it's going to continue, I'm going to need a black con uh, conductor, director. You know, I, I I have never been in the opera, but I have so many friends that it's just it's a love hate relationship because it's like you're coming in here telling me how to be me <laughs> and how to be black. Like that is the least, like my friend Robert said, it's, that's the least that um, companies can do is not tell me how to be black. <laughs> so yeah, you know, I, I, I already feel um, more comfortable in just owning who I am and uh, expressing who I am without re retribution, but that is what unapolog uh, being unapologetically black or Asian or anybody, that's what that means to me. Dean, do you want to, um, as the conductor in this space, and you and I had a no, lot of chat sure. about this too, right? I mean, conductors are, are people who hold power in a space. What are, what are no, well, definitely. I mean, yeah, you know, what we talked about was, yeah, you know, part of my philosophy, I guess, as a conductor is, yeah, you know, is about how you give power to the artist. And yeah, like, you know, I, I think all conductors really and all stage directors should kind of recognize that each person brings uh, unique qualities to the artistic process and you kind of have to give people the, the the floor and like the openness 
to be able to say, oh, I don't really like your tempo, or I would much rather be able to do this, or my vision of this role is that. And I think, yeah, you know, it, part of the way that I've always worked in is just giving artists that, that room to be able to uh, bring what they can to the table. And of course, so yeah, like, you know, one tries to guide it, one tries to have a complete conception for, uh, um, how the arc of an opera has to go. But yeah, you know, it's important that people feel that they're empowered to be able to bring their own voices to the artistic process. And I think, again, yeah, like, you know, when I'm just thinking about that, I think, yeah, you know, if we think about how the system of opera is, it's kind of run by executive directors, artistic directors, music directors, and those people in charge, I think, you know, it's really important uh, that they allow people to talk truthfully about, um, problems that might arise in the workplace, in the operatic workplace. And I think that it's just really important that uh, artistic leadership um, be supportive and listen to people and, and to listen to people of color if they have concerns or issues with certain things and not just kind of um, erase what their problems might be. And I think that that's kind of uh, something that um, I've run across. And when I've spoken with certain colleagues, you know, they find often that uh, their needs or their concerns are sometimes just erased. So that's something I try to, um, yeah, you know, I just try to, in my work as a conductor, not let people feel erased and feel that they're empowered to bring their own voices to the artistic work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Same for that. I mean, it's, um, I am also in agreement with all of you, you know, the one of the, for me, one of the, the key answers here is to have more people of color in this space, you know. Um, Janae, I think your example of Porgy and Bess is, it's not unique. I think it happens a lot. Um, you know, I think we've also, we've had that issue at Seattle Opera as well. Um, and so, you know, how do we really take this moment to, to really, um, to make those changes, right? To hear your voices, um, the voices of other um, artists and individuals of color who come into the space, Kazim, as you said, and feel like they're not being heard, um, and and to move, um, to not make these small moves, like Naomi said, you know, it feels like we're making these small steps, like, is it now a good time to just make really big ones? Like, let's just go for it. Let's just get in there and, <laughs> yeah, okay, we're all <laughs> oh, thumbs up on that. Um, you know, and, and, and to be able to make those, um, to be able to make those changes and to be able to create space for that. Um, we've talked a little bit around um, power dynamics and I wanted to, to delve into this um, topic a little bit and, and um, really looking at, um, an example that Naomi had in her um, book, Black Opera, around um, the Carmen in South Africa, right, of um, who holds the power and how can we change that? What does it mean for us to reappropriate this art form um, in a way of telling our own story? And, and so, Naomi, could you give us, uh, for, for the folks who are listening who may not be familiar with this story, um, in regard to the South African Carmen and how, how that um, ensemble really, again, reappropriated that story um, uh, to tell their story um, of their Black community. And Matthew, I don't know if, if this might be something that resonates with you in terms of Butterfly. You've talked about it a lot, about how do we rethink about, think about this and, and what might it mean to, um, to sort of take, take that back. Sure, Bizet's, Georges Bizet's opera from 1875, Carmen, is an opera that has been adapted probably more than any in the repertory. It's incredible. You've got Carmen, a flamenco Carmen, dance Carmens, a um, Bollywood Carmen, um, lots of Carmen. One of my favorites is the Carman, which was set in a British um, mechanics place. <laughs> sort of. So it's an opera that has had lots of, and I think it's having an unconventional woman who goes against the norm and has so much strength throughout the, um, the opera. Sadly, or in my opinion, sadly, no spoiler alerts, but you know, she's, she's not allowed to survive the end of the opera. So I was looking at a bunch of black adaptations and I say that deliberately because I was surprised that there are some here in the United States, uh, most notably the Oscar Hammerstein, um, Oscar Hammerstein II uh, Broadway musical from 1943, Carmen Jones, that we know it today primarily through the movie in 54 by um, Preminger with Dorothy Dandridge and 
all that, and I'll, I'll keep this quick. Um, the Hip Hopper with Beyonce that MTV did in um, 2001. But then I found there were two Sub-Saharan, oh, <laughs> yes, the Hip Hopper. Two Sub-Saharan uh, Carmens, one from 2001, the same year as the Hip Hopper, but in Senegal called Carmen Gay, directed by Joseph Guy Ramaka. And then this opera by um, Dimfo Di Campane, which is a company that had just started in 2000 in South Africa after, so apartheid is over in 94, so part of this new generation. And they're now evolved into the Asango Ensemble, and that's U Carmen Kailicha, which is an opera, um, Kailicha is a township outside of Cape Town. So it's been translated into Tosa, and all the singers are from the different townships. They are, um, there's a huge world of choralism that Black people have been singing, but everything with the apartheid system up through 94, Black folks were not allowed on the opera stage there. So it's incredible, this early post-apartheid um, generation of singers. And how they adapted is they've used the language. So they were working from an English translation that was then put back into their own language, Tosa. And as far as I know, it's like if probably the first opera sung in that Nguni click language. And it's just beautiful when you hear it. And this is available on Amazon. And, uh, you know, this is actually U Carmen Kailicha. You can find it. But also they put it in the townships with with references to this new post-apartheid moment. And so there are elements of violence, there's elements of poverty, unlike the Bizet story where you've got Carmen is really an exoticized other, sort of a Roma woman, and then you've got Don Jose who's from the north, from Navarre. Everyone is black, <laughs> everyone, is, and the power dynamics are different. How violence is used is different because this community in a post-apartheid state has been affected by violence. The police have a different meaning. And so the opera, there's a wonderful review um, or discussion of it in an article by Davis um, and Dovey, the two last names, that talk about Bizet. Carmen has gone to um, Bizet and Bizet has come to Kai Licha. And so this is a telling of the story where the music is familiar, the tunes are familiar, the story is familiar, though they add a sangoma, they add a sacrificing of a bull, they, they change a bunch of things, but it feels like Carmen. It won awards and it's an incredible work. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's a really powerful um, those are really powerful examples of how how artists of color can can take these works um, and and re reappropriate them. I'm using the term over and over again, but I think it's the right one, you know. I'll also say that these people had never been in an opera, most of them before. They might have sung opera arias or opera choral pieces adapted for choirs in their um, choral societies, or they might have, you know, they take, they were trained singers, but they hadn't had the opportunity to be in opera because it was illegal. So this is a new thing. And the people in Kailicha, the township, loved it. They turned a community hall into a movie theater. People were seeing it eight times. They love, so this actually, it's not just some weird experiment that, you know, who knows if it's going to work. This was something people loved. Um, and it worked really well internationally too. But I think really wonderfully is that the community that was in it, that was sort of claiming it and retelling the story in their own voice, they loved it. Great. Matthew, does that bring anything to mind for you um, as you consider your, your history and your connection with, um, I mean, I, 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 I have to apologize because I recognize that I'm like tagging butterfly onto you, um, but we've had this conversation, yeah, everyone right? Everyone is, it's fine. No, no, it's... <laughs> but we've also had this conversation yeah. and also your relationship with Seattle Opera started around the community conversation for Butterfly. So um, just to give some context and also to apologize that I continue to do this. No, thing. no. I mean, look, like, <laughs> A butterfly is going to keep being produced um, on the main stages at major opera houses because it's an incredible piece. It makes a lot of money. Everyone wants to see it. I totally, totally get it. Um, and 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 so I have. I've like been digging, 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 trying to be like, how? What it, does it mean to reclaim it? And you know, I think Pacific Opera Project 
recently did a version where it was all, you know, Asian singers. I think the Japanese sang in Japanese. So it was all translated in Japanese, which was really illuminating to hear it in that way. None of the music was changed, right? It was all um, as is, you know, I, I um, am actually, you don't want to like be any, do any spoiler alerts, but I have already pitched a totally revisionist new version of it for two major opera companies in the US who are very interested in, the, in what I'm calling Butterfly 2021, um, that I'm really saying, what happens when we put butterfly within a contemporary Mer American context, right? There are so many questions that are within butterfly that we're constantly asking that I'm like, why, why aren't we exploring it in that way? Right? Like what is the American dream? What must, you know, must an immigrant give up their heritage and culture in order to be accepted? You know, does the outsider, the foreigner, stand a chance to survive in a system that so easily disposes of them? You know, what does it mean to belong? What does it mean to love a country that doesn't necessarily accept you? What does it mean to want to escape one's otherness? And what does it mean to want to be white? Right, like these are some big issues that are totally applicable right now that is, they are all within Butterfly. It's just a matter of looking at it through a different lens. And I think that, you know, it, all the music would be there. The beauty would be there, but it would enable audiences to completely have their, you know, be kind of transformed um, because they would just experience it in a totally new way. And look, it's gonna, you know, I think great in different ways because maybe Kate Pinkerton is not the savior who comes in and takes, you know, the baby. It's like, you know, no, this, this baby is being taken away from, from its mother. Um, like we've been seeing at the border and the detention centers over and over again, not even a year ago, or a year ago. And in, 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 within detention centers, it used to be Japanese internment camps, right? So like, this is, this is happening right now. And I, and I think that looking at Butterfly in that way, and also I think, you know, I think in terms of dissecting it, like we have to look at the fact that these pieces probably went through many different forms of editing. So I actually am interested in, in dissecting the Brescia version that Puccini wrote that I directed at Santa Fe because there are so many elements of the Brescia version that really highlight specific qualities of the Americans and views of the Japanese towards the Americans that were later taken out of the version that we now know. And putting those in, again, just kind of rejiggers everyone's you know an audience's ability to just they can't just coast along and be comfortable they kind of like have moments where they're like I was I'm not used to hearing that and it was written by Puccini so I think that those are you know some ways that I'm like thinking about it in addition to the fact that it's like who are our operas for right what communities are we really speaking to and if we're wanting to engage other communities well then we really need to be telling stories that they want to hear. And I, you know, I think that, you know, I directed an American soldier for Opera Theater of St. Louis that Huang Ro and David Henry Huang wrote about Danny Chen, um, you know, who, an American soldier who, because of, you know, um, um, abuse and, and, and um, you know, oppression in, in the military committed suicide. You know, an American dream was written. I think these pieces are being written. And I think that they're as equally as important in showing the breadth that opera can be um, as much as re in reinterpreting and, and redigging into some of these classics. Absolutely, Janae. I was just gonna say in addition to reimagining a lot of these classics, we have to have new works that are by people that look like me <laughs> and that look like you, Matthew, and, and that represent what this country looks like. Um, the classics are, are going to be there as they should be. Um, Reimagining them is something that should also happen. But um, now is the time to really to go there. And 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 there are there are major opera works by black composers that exist. So companies need to do the work and um, program them. They're great. Um, so that you know, in addition to to reimagining our tradition, more traditional operas, we need to add to our canon um, so that it represents all of our stories. And, and that 
our audiences become more diverse and more um, um, representative of who we are as as a people. Um, it's also more lucrative, <laughs> you know. It's just if we're gonna talk about the business side of things, like, duh, come on. People want yeah. to see themselves on stage. They they want to see their stories. So, um, you know, that for me, I I'm personally working on a few projects that bring my story, bring, bring the black stories to to everyone, and and that also includes stories that are not only about oppression, you know. I wanna do a love story. I, I'm a mezzo. We don't often get to be like <laughs> innocent characters. <laughs> that not happened. I want to just like be this non-guilty character um, that the audience falls in love with. Hopefully they fall in love with me because I, I sing well and you know, I'm convincing and that <laughs> stuff. But um, this is really an opportunity, a, a great opportunity that we have to, um, expand on this beautiful art form. I absolutely, agree. I completely agree with that. And, um, you know, it, it's, uh, I do think that a lot of more new works uh, have been and will continue to emerge that, um, that uh, give voice to, um, to BIPOC folks. And, and, you know, Matthew sort of alluded this, um, mentioned this too, you know, Boem as the moneymaker is taking the risk of saying, we're not going to do the moneymaker because we want to do this piece because it's the right piece and it's one we haven't heard yet. Um, or how we pair that up um, with the with the butterflies um, and really giving way to that. Um, Kazim, I know you have something you want to share. Sure, yeah, I just wanted to just sort of uh, also sort of jump on. I mean, jump on top of what Janae just said. I mean, you know, there's so, yeah, you know, of course, the standard repertoire will always be there. And like, you know, there's so many ways of reimagining sort of some of the standard repertoire with different kinds of people. I mean, I'll just give like a very short, short example. I remember years ago, I saw sort of at the, um, um, I, uh, um, in South Africa, I saw someone do a Macbeth that was kind of set in a, uh, that was sort of set in Zimbabwe, and I guess, yeah, you know, one could have said that the Macbeth, he could have represented someone like uh, Robert Mugabe, and I, I thought that the way that this young South African director handled the story, having an all-black cast of singers, and sort of resetting Macbeth in a different continent, a different language, a different kind of story, but the, the essence of the story, how power corrupts, and all of these things was still very much there. And I think that there's lots of opportunities for these sort of reimagining of standard works. And the other thing I wanted, there were just, uh, there were just two, two more points I wanted to bring out. Um, in my sort of fantasy world, I always think, I wonder if people like, you know, if people like Wagner and Verdi, if they had had the opportunity to work with minority singers and black singers, or say if Puccini had had the chance to actually work with an Asian singer, I always think, yeah, you know, how, yeah, like, you know, like in my imagination, I always think, oh, if Wagner had heard someone like Jesse Norman, he would have created a whole new opera for her or something like that. Like, you know what I mean? And I think as we try to add to the repertoire, which a lot of companies are doing, yeah, you know, and I can name so many great operas um, from um, Hong Ro's opera that was done in St. Louis to, um, oh, you know, Malcolm X by Anthony Davis, or, or, or um, there's one project that I'm working on with the Cincinnati Opera called Castor and Patience, and that kind of, yeah, like, you know, like where you have a black librettist and a white composer, I think it's completely possible that one can find different voices and bring them together so that they can inform each other. And I would just think, or I just hope that more opera companies that they try to push things forward and uh, find new standard repertoire pieces that we can look back 100 years from now and say, okay, this piece was done then and it had this impact the way we see Atala or the way we see pieces like Nabucco. Yeah, like, you know, like things dealing with the Italian Risorgimento and all that stuff that we can look back and say, oh yeah, in America, this was Ameri this was Black American opera and this was like a starting point for something. So I think if, if the framework is there for American opera companies, I think that's a good kind of mental framework, I think, to start from. Yeah. Go ahead, Janae. All right, I know we're still on this question, but uh, Kazim just inspired me. Um, I 
can imagine that many opera companies are um, fearful that if, <clears throat> how do I say this? <laughs> <laughs> I actually think that um, these suggestions that we're, we're making are, are not saying that we are trying to take away these standard operas. Absolutely not. Like, again, I cannot imagine a world where I'm, I'm not able to sing Carmen or Delilah or any of these amazing works. Um, but I think one of the greatest issues with, in general, is that people think with the addition or slight changing of, of this traditional art form that they're going to lose their audience base, um, they're going to lose their funding, they're going to like the, the history of opera is going to be erased. And that's just simply not the case. Um, I sang, the last role that I sang was Delilah and Samson and Delilah at Washington National Opera. And it was a huge success before it uh, was ended by COVID. But um, the first night I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, people came out in droves, black people, um, and it was sold out, you know? And so for me, I just encourage um, artistic and general directors to not be afraid. I mean, like, we're not asking for you to get out of your seat. Like my friend Karen Slack said, we're, we're just asking you to move over so we can sit in ours. And it's just, it, it, it's so true all across the board. Um, and again, it, it's going to really, really enhance um, everything about our art form, in my opinion. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I think that that's a real worry. Um, but I, I can attest to the fact that like, it's, it's just not the case, you know, <laughs> it's not. Yeah. Well, and we can't be blinded by that, right? I mean, we can't, exactly. we can't let that hold up basic human decency. Yes, um, and even and, if it- And respecting people, right? Like that's absolutely. not a good enough excuse in my, in my personal book. <laughs> I definitely agree with you. And even if it does, you know, cause um, the revenue to decrease some, like it will skyrocket eventually, you know, change. Well, you know, interestingly, um, it, I think the statistic right now is that 50% of Americans under the age of 16 identify as POC. So that's half of the population, right? So let's say in 10 years time when they're getting into their, you know, mid late twenties as they're starting to make their own choices about what they're interested in and buying in, 50% of that population, if they're not seeing themselves represented, if they're not seeing a space where they feel like they belong, where they can be included, what does that mean, right? Um, and, and so I think that's, that's pretty powerful. We are running um, towards the end of our, of our time together. We've had some amazing questions come in from folks listening. Um, and um, I have also asked you to, um, you panelists, um, to share some parting thoughts. Um, for the folks who have submitted questions, we are collecting those and I hope that we'll be able to um, if not address them in these final thoughts here with the panelists um, that we'll be able to um, share them um, via blog post or a way that we can respond to to some of your questions which are um, really important um, but I did want to hear from everybody and Janae you kind of kicked us off um, and I was gonna start with you anyway um, because I wanted to hear from you all I'm going to combine one of the questions, right? I think one of the questions that I asked everybody to consider is what are, you know, what's, what is a, a top priority that you think needs to be addressed um, by, um, by opera companies in the industry? Um, and how might you, you address that? So I'm going to combine that with, you know, what do you want to offer up to opera leaders um, as they begin to, to think about emerging, you know, in this post-COVID world. So that's one. And then two, what's your message of support that you want to offer up to BIPOC individuals who are listening today? So Janae, you offered up the wonderful um, um, statement about, you know, don't worry, we still love the classics, they're there. Make room for other voices at the table. Um, what else would you like to share? I'll just say quickly, because I want to give time for others, but um, just for companies and everyone involved in the opera business to be intentional. Um, go out to your community. Out, outreach is simply not enough. Um, go out to your communities and learn them. Learn what speaks to them, how they speak, and, and how um, they receive 
you know i i honestly believe that um that is a huge aspect and factor as to why um i, I know many black philanthropists but they do not feel connected to this classical world because it it doesn't speak to them in a genuine way in a, in a way that 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 represents them so um that's one of my offerings. <laughs> and um, for all of the up and coming um, artists, be your, my, my advice is to be your whole authentic, true self um, and practice. <laughs> like, yes, definitely keep that going. But yeah, don't apologize for who you are. Kazim. Yes, uh, I guess I would say uh, if I were speaking to leaders of various African Guineas, I would say to sort of think outside of the box and don't think of the past as being normal. And, um, and I think you have to ask yourself, what does this new normal look like in your institutions? Uh, does it, I mean, does it reflect uh, the world we actually live in at the moment? And does it reflect the communities that you're based in and that we live in? And I, I think those questions are important for the survival of opera in America. And um, the other thing I would say is, um, you know, the company should maybe use this opportunity to reshape how the organization looks like, both physically, but then also in what types of music is being offered. And I just think this is a wonderful time to further the art form. Um, and then to BIPOC artists and administrators, I would just say, I mean, my main thing I would say is just be prepared and ready to go once we get through this period. Um, yeah, you know, you want to explore other interests and things like this, but also keep an eye out on your craft and continue to expand your knowledge about music and opera while we're in this kind of downtime. Thank you. Naomi? I can keep this quick because um, it came to me sort of succinctly. The first thing I want to say is um, for directors or opera administration, let's learn from Zoom that we can do things and record them and bring people together to have conversations, that we can put content up on websites, as well as having dialogues in person, as well as doing front of the lobby um, sort of information, as well as having program essays. Let's have some more of this when we don't have to. <laughs> but can open it up for a lot of folks. And then for the people who are particularly new audiences, you are not alone. There, look at us, a full panel with Latinx, Asian, and African-American Black folks loving working at high levels in opera. There's so many things we can do. You can write about it and teach like me, or you can go for the glam and um, be on stage, or you can be behind the stage. So you're not alone if you love the arts. Their, their voices are, and presence are so deeply needed. Thank you, Naomi. And Matthew. Yeah, uh, oh gosh, everyone's words are so articulate and beautiful. I, I guess um, to administrators, um, you know, I think, I think something I, I always notice is that these panels do make people really uncomfortable. Right, I think it's just in the nature of what we're going through, what we're digging in, um, the sort of expenditure, which what we're giving. And I think one of the key things to remember is that we love opera, right? Like we love this art form, we love this music, we cherish what it is. And I am, you know, what Janae was saying, like we're not about like tear everyone down and get rid of everyone that exists. Like, no, 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 no. It's just about broadening you know, perspectives, allowing other people to be board members and trustees and donors and leaders and administrators and staff and volunteers and artists and production staff and technicians and musicians. I mean, there's so many people involved in opera, hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds. And more perspectives are just better. They're going to lead to greater health and even more value to society. So I think my big thing is lean into the discomfort and remember that it's okay to learn and grow and be uncomfortable. And then to BIPOC artists, oh my gosh, all of what you guys said is amazing. I guess be ready to go, you know, stay strong, be unified. You know, yes, you may not see yourself in it right now, but like we're hoping to pave the way for generations to come and 
if this is something you're interested in doing, you know, keep going, keep going. And I think something that's really been on my mind is, you know, I want to be a mentor. I think education and mentorship is so important to allow people access in and then teach them all the ways of how, what opera is and how it works. And so, you know, just know that like reach out to people, artists that exist, you might find a mentor in any one of us because, you know, we're willing to like take you under our wing. Um, and it's really important that your voice is heard and that you know that, yes, we are in this together. Um, and this industry is viable and possible um, for all of us. Absolutely. Thank you, Matthew. And that was one of the statements that had come in. Um, and Matthew, you had mentioned this too, that as we um, really make this, um, I kind of hate like calling it a new step because it's just, I think it just makes me sad that we haven't done enough of it, right? Of bringing in folks of color into opera and, and um, either empowering, giving room, the seat at the table, giving them the education that's needed. Uh, we did have a comment that came through about, you know, setting them up for success and what can we do about that? So thank you, Matthew, for offering up, right? How can we mentor? How can we educate? Um, you know, what, what can we... What can we do? Janae, are you, did you want to add something to that? You're, you're on mute there. <laughs> Sorry, no, I was actually just reading some of the, the questions oh. that we didn't address. <laughs> and it, and it, this conversation makes people uncomfortable, but it's good. And apparently someone has dropped their subscription. That is really sad for them. Um, but th these things are going to happen. You know, they are. And we, like you said, Alejandra, have to work through that, you know? We do. Yeah, that's right. And I think, you know, there's um, a lot of opera companies um, are, are tackling these uncomfortable um, topics, um, each in their own way. And, you know, I've, everybody's um, community looks different and you have to do what's right for that community. But to listen, to be in the uncomfortable, um, to really just to listen, right, without defense, without trying to say, oh, but you don't understand. No, maybe you don't understand. Um, and really taking the time um, to listen and to, and to pay attention and, and for companies to take the risk. Um, I have a lot of hopes for um, what is happening and um, I have a lot of hopes for, for moving forward. I wanna thank all of you for being here and um, joining in this conversation. Um, we addressed this at the beginning, Naomi brought it up, but I do want to acknowledge that um, by entering and engaging in this conversation, you all have added to your emotional labor. And I want to thank you for, for having done that um, as part of this conversation. And I just, I am so grateful and have so much respect for all of you. Um, so thank you for, for joining us today. Thank you um, for acknowledging that. Yeah. Um, and I want to thank everybody who attended for watching and for your wonderful questions. Like I said, I apologize that um, we did not have the time to address them one by one. Um, but I, I'm a stickler for at least ending on time if I can't start on time. Thank you for enduring our technical issues um, and going through that with us. We will try to get to your questions in some form or another, and we will continue these conversations. I also wanted to give a really big thank you to the geniuses behind the scenes, Alex Minami and and Gabrielle Nomura Gaynor. Um, they have tackled this subject bravely um, in preparation for this panel. I always learn so much from them, and so I'm so grateful. They've been working tirelessly to coordinate and promote the event, and to Caroline Webb, who um, I'm just dubbing her our Zoom guru uh, for supporting this chat um, and helping us all look very good on this in this conversation. And lastly, I want to thank uh, Seattle Opera donors and subscribers for their continued support and dedication. Um, this is a really difficult time for us to um, be um, an arts organization that cannot produce and present opera in the traditional way. We're all learning new forms of doing it, um, but we thank you for your continued support. Thank you all again for joining us. I am grateful to each and every one of you, um, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you all so much. Take care. <laughs>